Hello and good day. My name is Dr. Corey Hall. You can simply call me Corey. I welcome you to the Bob Scholar YouTube channel where I have been uploading videos since 2008. I currently have over 1,100 videos on YouTube and the current view count is almost at 50 million. You might be wondering what happened to this Bob Scholar guy. First of all, he chopped his hair off. You know, I had the long flowing hair with a ponytail. He's chopped his hair off. He doesn't upload very many videos anymore. Has he lost his mind? Is he okay? Well, let me tell you this. I'm going as strong as ever. The well-rounded pianist is going as strong as ever. And I am simply taking a sabbatical from YouTube for good reason, because I am too busy writing books like my best-selling sight reading in harmony which is the number one world's system of sight reading on keyboard instruments i'm also editor-in-chief of box scholar publishing where you can purchase books like this for your learning pleasure i'm also simply too busy growing and expanding the well-rounded pianist for your learning purposes I want to be your personal professor. I want to teach you all I know on the well-rounded pianist. Now sit back and view a 24-minute video that I recently uploaded to the well-rounded pianist for members only. It is very rare that I show this kind of video on YouTube because I want to spend all my time pleasing my happy and satisfied members all over the world if you want to learn from me and want me to be your personal professor in piano and music theory and other aspects of piano, you need to join the Well-Rounded Pianist today. It's only 68 cents a day and you get access to over 1,500 videos in all aspects of piano. It's simply an incredible website one of the finest websites in the world, actually, as I speak. Sit back and enjoy an introduction to fingering in hymns and chorales. Hello and good day to all well-rounded pianist members. This video today is on an introduction to fingering in hymns and chorales. I get a lot of questions as a teacher about fingering. And I have omitted fingering in sight reading and harmony past grade four for a good reason, because you will become a better sight reader that way. I am in the process of writing an article on the Box Scholar website on fingering, so you can learn more about that there when the article is ready. But for now, I want to go over general rules of fingering that will help you determine good and practical fingering for hymns or chorales, traditional church hymns or Bach chorales, which are basically the same thing. It's just that your average church hymn is a little less harmonically complicated than Bach chorales. If you can play Bach chorales, you can play pretty much anything and I point this out in Sight Reading and Harmony. This example uh, that I want to work with today is from Sight Reading and Harmony. It is number one from part four. Number one from part four, it's only four bars long. Only four bars long here. Remember the complete chorale, you can find it's number one in the 24 easy four part chorales. That's the one that has the passing tones eighth note passing tones, and it has all the extra notes in it. This is from the grade seven to eight line. Grade seven to eight. So it's gonna be this line right here, the next to the last line down on the first page. The reason why I'm choosing this is because it eliminates passing tones and we don't have to get into that. Now let's go over some rules fingering rules in hymns and chorales that I've laid out here. Number one, work by phrases. Work by phrases, hands alone, then together. 
in the Bach chorales and in many church hymns, you'll see these fermatas, fermata like that. We have them here in this example. Here's a fermata after the fourth chord. Here's another fermata after the next four chords. And then you have a string of chords here and then a fermata. These are phrases. Always work in phrases. Work hands alone, then together. Don't expect to put everything together all at once, unless you are very advanced. Number two, always know if you should distribute as two plus two or three plus one in the right hand plus left hand. Let me explain. There are pretty much only two possibilities in the plane of chorales. Okay, you have two hands. You have four parts, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Soprano, alto, tenor, bass. You can either play two notes with one hand and two notes with the other. That's what I call two plus two. Or you can also play three plus one. Three notes in the right hand, one note in the left hand. There is also the option, the opposite of that. You could play three notes in the left hand, one note in the right hand. Now, that, this three notes in the left hand, one note in the right hand is very rare. You will find that, but that's not going to happen very often. So for our purposes now, all we have to really be concerned with is whether we're going to have two notes in the left, two notes in the right, or one note in the left hand and three notes in the right hand. Those are the only two options right now for our purposes. If octave or greater between tenor and bass, then take tenor with the right hand. For example, do you see this is the bass, this is the tenor. What's that distance? between that. Well, C to C is an octave. This is a tenth. That's ten notes apart. You can't reach that. Some people can, but even if you could reach it with your left hand, you're always better off taking it with the right hand. That's why I put this little bracket right there. That bracket means you're going to take those three notes with the right hand. So just because a tenor note is notated in the bass clef area, that does not necessarily mean that you will take it with the left hand. It's actually easier to do it with the right hand. We'll look at that in a minute. Number four, know when to release fingers. You're not always holding fingers down all the time. You have to release some fingers to get to the next chord. Therefore, you must know when to release your fingers. And in, in doing that, you need to look for two and three chord groups or slurs. Very, very often in playing hymns and chorales, actually all the time, you will encounter, you will encounter groups or pairs. And I'm going to show you this in a minute here where you're not just going to play from here to the end all totally perfectly legato with your fingers. You can't do that. That's impossible. So we have to break things down into smaller units. Those are the main four rules, I would say, for fingering in hymns and chorales. There are other rules as well, but these are the ones that came to mind that are the most important for us. Let's look at this. First of all, let's figure out which hand is going to take which one of these. Well, as I told you before, here's a bracket here, here's a bracket here. You're actually going to take from here to here, that first full phrase, you're going to take all of the tenor notes with the right hand. You see that? So you'll only have to worry about playing the left hand on these. Get rid of that. I'll explain that in a minute. Then, 
from this chord to this chord, the next phrase of four chords, look, look at how, look at the distance between the tenor and the bass. These go down to there. This means that you can definitely play these with the left hand. So you do not need to play that with the right hand anymore, as we did in this phrase. So we're going to play these with the left hand. It stays small. This is only three notes apart. And these expand out to only a fifth. In other words, from here to here, you're only going to play, you're going to play these two notes here with the left hand. That means you're going to play these two notes, the right hand. So from here to here is more normal. I would call that just sort of normal, the way it looks on the page. Two notes in the left, two notes in the right. From the beginning, we have one note in the left hand, three notes in the right hand for all four of those chords. From here to here, we have two notes in the right, two notes in the left. And now let's look what happens from here to the end. From here to the end, we have, well, that's a tenth. G to B is a tenth. You could reach out if you have big hands, but I would suggest not doing that. Actually, there's a trick. And the trick is to do this. If, and, and you can very often do this. See this note B? You can actually bring that up, and you can actually play that with the right hand. It's perfectly permissible to do that, and then you don't have to play it in the tenor, so I'll cross that out. I've, I've had people ask me this very often, how do you play that, how, how do you reach that? Well, you don't. You don't reach it. You just put it up here, an octave and then you just play those with the right hand. No one will know the difference. No one will even know that, that, that you've taken that and transposed it up an, an octave. Now, I can reach that. I mean, pianists with big hands can reach that, but the average person can't. So there's no, there's no sense in losing sleep over that. It's better just to transpose it up an octave. Look at what happens from here to here. Look at the distance between the bass and the tenor. Another tenth, another tenth. That's an octave, that's fifth. But that's another tenth there. That's a seventh, and that's a tenth. This means that from, from here, all the way to here, to the end, including this one, we're going to play three notes in the right hand, three notes in the right hand, one note in the left hand. That actually makes it easier for fingering. So we've worked by phrases. We have phrase number one, phrase number two, phrase number three. Always know if you should distribute as 2 plus 2 or 3 plus 1. We've done that. This is 3 plus 1 up to here. It's 2 plus 2 up to here. And it's 3 plus 1 up to here. Now I chose this example for a reason because it, it doesn't mix it up. But you, you will actually find in other chorales it's not as easy and straightforward as this one. You might have in the middle somewhere, you know, you might have three notes in the right, one note in the left for three chords, and then all of a sudden you might have to change to two plus two and then go back to three plus one. It doesn't always work this nicely. That's why I'm using this as simply an introduction to fingering. I will have other videos in the future on other examples with fingering. If octave or greater between tenor and bass, then take tenor with right hand. Okay, we've done that. Know when to release fingers. Now we need to talk a little about this. If you analyze this, now I'm going to play it. 
actually, and I'm going to play. I'm going to play this, and I'm not going to use pedal. And I want you to listen very carefully on where I'm breaking. listened carefully, you would have noticed that I did a two-note slur here, I did a two-note slur here, I did a two-note slur here, and a two-note slur here. So you have only two-note slurs. And I use five, four, five, four. This is the top finger of the right hand. And then four, five, four, five. Picture this. Sit at the piano and picture this. You're going to put five on C, two on G, and one on E. Always play the fingers that are closest to the keys at any given time. In fact, I forgot to put that here. In fact, I'll add that. Number five. Play fingers closest to the keys at any given time. So you have five, two, one. Now, if you have five, two, one here, then all you have to do is just slightly adjust your finger. If you have four there, then you have two and one. So you have a four, two, one here. Four, two, one. Five, two, one. Four, two, one. Lift. That's why I put this rest here. So you're going to lift. And then we have a two note uh, slur here. Five, three, one. And then four, two, one. I'll explain pedaling in different videos. We're not talking about pedaling in this video, but eventually you'll, you, eventually you'll use pedal to cover up the gaps. Now we have fours on the top note. And here, here we're going to have 2 plus 2. We have 4 on the top note, 2 here. If you, have, if you have a 4 and a 2, then this will logically move to a 5 and a 1. Lift. That's another 8th note here. Then if you have, if you go to 4 to 5, you're going to have, just simply go 1 to 1. Here. Let's look at from here to here, and then we'll go over the left hand. Well, I would suggest, so sometimes you have to think backwards also. Look at this largely spaced chord here. You're going to have 5, 2, 1 on here. 5, 2, 1. Now, if you play 5, 2, 1 on, on C, F sharp, and, and C, what fingers are closest Play this. What fingers are closest to these? Well, it's 5, 4, 2. 5, 4, 2. So if you play 5, 4, 2 on these, you'll be very close. Just a slight adjustment, and you'll be on 5, 2, 1 on these. Then you'll go to 4, 2, 1. 3, 2, 1. Okay, we're not going to do two note slurs here because it's more of a long phrase. Three, two, one. Four, two, one. Lift. Put here, lift. Okay, put a little caesura here. That's a caesura in music meaning to 
take a little time. We're going to lift our hand, replant the fingers on here. Five, four, two. Five, four, two. Then you have to hold five down because this is a half note. Remember, you have to hold that down. If you play five, four, two, then you have three, one here. Three, one. And then the fingers that lie closest to these are four, two, one at the end. You need to practice this now with this finger in all the way to the end with just the right hand. Now let's look at the left hand. Let's look at this phrase from here to here. What's the highest note and lowest note? Well, that's the highest note. That's the lowest note. That's an octave. This means, logically, that we'll play our thumb on that and five on that. What finger is lying over C when you, when you have your thumb over G and your fifth finger over G? Three. What finger is lying over D? Two. The finger has to lie over that key. Don't play five here. A lot of beginners will play five here and one here and then maybe four here and then they won't be able to reach there. You have to think of the whole phrase. Think of the highest note and the lowest note and then sort of gauge your fingering from that. These were, from here to here, we have two notes in the right hand. Now we're going to have two notes in the left hand. Well, there's only one option for this. This and this will have to play one and five. What fingers are closest? If you play five on C and you play one on B flat, what fingers are lying over these? Well, one, two. You simply slide your thumb down to A, and you play two on F. So you have one, five, one, two. What fingers are lying closest to D and F? Well, two, four. If you have two, four on these, what fingers are lying closest to C and G? One and five. So you simply play one and five. This is logic 1A, or logic 101. Let's look at this phrase now, from here to here. This is all one phrase. That's a long phrase, actually, in Bach chorales. What's the highest note and the lowest note? That's the highest note. And these are the lowest notes. We have a G and a G, an octave apart. This means... Then on these G's, we're going to play 5. On this G, we're going to play 1. Now, what fingers lie over these notes if you have 5 on this G and 1 on this G? Pretty easy. 4 here, 3 here, 2 here. 3 here, and 2 here. And there you have it. There you have the left hand fingering. It's really that simple. The easiest way to do it, especially if you only have one one note in a hand, say one note in the left hand, like from here to here, or from here to here, is you always want to find the, the highest note of the phrase and the lowest note of the phrase. Usually, most of the time, all of those notes can usually fit in one hand span. Very often, they will be a span of an octave. So we have to start thinking thinking outside of five finger positions. You have to sort of get out of that mode of only thinking five finger positions, like a beginner thinks. Start expanding your hand out and start thinking what's the lowest note and what's the highest note of the phrase. And that's the lowest, this is the highest. And then usually when, it's, when you're in an octave span between the lowest and the highest note, then fingers will just sort of fall into place between those two extremes. So here's what you need to do. I would suggest taking this by phrase from here to here, practice hands alone, then hands together. Take this phrase, play it hands alone, then hands together. 
And do the same with this phrase from here to here, hands alone and hands together, with all of this fingering. But here's, here's the deal. See if you can do this without, eventually without having the fingering all written in. I know I have it written in here, which is going to help you like a crutch. You might want to photocopy, I would say, a good, a good thing to do is, if you have this hard copy, photocopy this page, or maybe take a picture of it, and then write in, you might want to write in these fingerings at first. Learn it with written in fingerings. Then see if you can do it, either erase the fingerings or throw the page away and try it from the book without the fingerings written in, say a week or two later. And that will help you solidify the fingerings in your head. I find that if you write in too many fingerings, it tends to be too much of a crutch, and in the long term, you won't really learn fingering very well. But in the beginning, it's okay. It's sort of like training wheels. You know, when a, when a small child learns to ride a bicycle, he has training wheels, then eventually you take off the training wheels when the child can ride the bicycle. So riding in fingerings like this that I'm doing here are like the training wheels. If you can do this without riding in fingerings, and you can do it internalizing the fingerings in your head, and using these rules, then you will be on your way to determining good and logical and practical fingerings. Until we meet again, thank you.